the 17 day kickstart diet. Thought to myself, you wrote about the 17 day diet in 2010. We've got the 17 day kickstart diet out now. What is it about 17 days? Doesn't it take 21 days to form a new habit? How are you doing it in 17? You know, so you're right, you're spot on with that, right? Um, and that's probably over the last 10 years, the most common. Do you have a, a story maybe like an illustria, illustrative example of a patient that has, or someone you've worked with that has really transformed their lives using your plan? I'm sure you have so many. You know, there are a lot and I'm so fortunate. about a challenge for you that has significantly formed you into the person, into the man that you are today? When I, so there's a, there's kind of a couple things that come to mind. First and foremost, when, when I was 12 years old, um, to season two of Flourish or Fold, where well-known people share their lesser well-known story of resilience. We have such a treat for all of you today, Dr. Michael Rafael Marino, known as Dr. Mike. He first wrote the book, The 17 Day Diet in 2010. And since then, millions of people have lost weight using his safe, effective and fast formula for weight loss. I'm so excited to have Dr. Mike with us here today to talk not only about weight loss and the challenges that ensue, but also for him to share a bit of his story. Welcome, Dr. Mike. Thank you so much for having me. I am really, really excited. Oh, we're so delighted to have you with us. And you know, one of the things that came up for me as I was reading your most recent book, <laughs> there it is. There it is. The 17 day kickstart diet. I thought to myself, you wrote about the 17 day diet in 2010. We've got the 17 day kickstart diet out now. What is it about 17 days. Doesn't it take 21 days to form a new habit? How are you doing it in 17? You know, so you're right. You're spot on with that, right? Um, and that's probably over the last 10 years, the most common question I'm asked. And, you know, the whole idea of creating habits, rather, you know, whether good or bad, is is the time frame. And the, the concept of sort of where something just becomes automatic, right? Like we really don't think about it much. There's less effort into whatever it is we're doing. For me, it, it fell always between two and three weeks. So to your point, right, that 21 day habit. For me, you know, when you start to look at metabolic changes, when you start to look at basal metabolic rate, um, one of the big reasons and people out there listening if you've been on a diet you're going along and you're losing weight and all of a sudden at about two to three weeks even though you're doing what you're supposed to be doing the weight loss kind of stops it stagnates it, it sort of plateaus is that term we use and it's because the body's smart the, the metabolic rate can shift can change and you can continue to do what you're doing, but because that decrease in metabolic rate occurs, you don't burn the calories, you don't lose the weight. So right at about two to three weeks, between 14 and 21, is where that process begins to occur. So between 14 and 21, 17 was born, and, uh, and there we have it. I love it. I love it. That's so fantastic. And 
you, this is not only a, a prescription that you share with your patients, this has been a profoundly life-changing element for you in terms of how you engage in healthy habits. Is that right? It really has. And, um, you know, it's one of those things, and I'll never forget um, a few years, uh, gosh, it's been about six years ago, I was in a hotel room and I hopped on a scale and I was like, whoa, uh, you know, I've been very trim all my life. I've been very active, but life caught up with me. And I took a picture of that number on the scale and I sent it to my brother and my brother said, whose weight is that? And I said, mine. And he said, it looks like someone better start reading their own books. <laughs> and, and I was like, yeah, okay. And I thought to myself, what happened? And life happened, things happened, not always bad stuff. You know, I got married and things were just rolling along and you just, you know, one pound becomes five, becomes 10. And then the next thing you know it, you're like, how did I gain 50 pounds? But it happens, it's real, it's life. And it happened to me. So I kind of went back to the vault and uh, I started utilizing my own tools and prescriptions. And um, I'm happy to say I'm back where I, I, I should be. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Well, you know, and I think that that was sort of weight gain slide, you know, it's, it's so real for so many of us. It's getting busy with work and sort of putting our heads down and it's getting married and it's having children and so many things that occupy our time that keep us from exercising and eating the way we want to. Right. You know, I say to my patients all the time, we all know right from wrong. We all get in a car. We know we're supposed to stop at stop signs. We know we're supposed to stop at red lights. We know we're supposed to drive the speed limit. We know all these things, but sometimes we don't do them. And when you apply that to lifestyle and behavioral change, we know right from wrong. We, you know, I, one of the things I do with my patients, I said, if I were to put 10 different examples of meals on the floor in this exam room, I'll bet you could pick out the healthy ones and the unhealthy ones 100% of the time. And they say, yes, I could. The question is, why don't we? And I think the simple truth is that life gets in the way and we struggle and that struggle is real. And I think oftentimes we're just too hard on ourselves and we don't give you know, the credit to the challenges that life can pose for us. And we just think we're supposed to just roll through it. And uh, I'm here to tell you that it, 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 it's not that easy. <laughs> Absolutely. And I love that you're calling out this idea of like knowing versus doing. Right, a lot that's of times it. when we hear advice, we're like, I know that, I know that, but we don't do that. Right. And, you know, people say it to me all the time, yeah, I know what I'm supposed to do. I'll see, I still see patients every single day, every week. Um, and I've been doing so for 25 years. And uh, th th my patients are my family, I, you know, I've known them for generations and it just goes on and on and on. So I'm very frank with them. I'm very just kind of like a friend talking uh, to another friend. And, and, and I will say, they all say, yeah, I know I'm supposed to be doing this. Thing. Exactly to your point. But yet they're sitting there, their sugars are out of control. They're 50 or 100 pounds or more overweight. Their blood pressure is out of control. Everything's going south. And it's kind of like, all right, we how do we get back on track? But you're absolutely right. We know, but how do we do? Do you have a, a story, maybe like an illustria, illustrative example of a patient that has, or someone you've worked with that has really transformed their lives using your plan? I'm sure you have so many. You know, there are a lot and I'm so fortunate and I love my patients dearly because they give me that that sort of energy that I need to to do the stuff that I've been doing, which is write books and is, you know, create these deliverables in terms of education and, and tools for getting being healthy. But there is one very unique one. And, and quite honestly, it was the nucleus of this whole 17 day journey. And it took place about 15 years ago, I was in a room with a patient who I'd known for about a decade. Her sugars had suddenly gotten completely out of control. And she wasn't typically a person to do that. So I said to her, what happened? I said, there are three things that affect your sugars, your food, your activity, 
and, and you know, hydration, basic things. And I said, so, and, and medications, of course. She says, I'm taking my medications, I'm still eating properly, but my neighbor that I used to always walk with and exercise moved and I stopped exercising. So at that point, I thought, how, to cor how do you correct the variable in this equation? The variable was that she stopped exercising. So I offered to exercise with her. And I said, if you can meet me at my office, I start patients at 745. If you can meet me at 630, I'm going to walk with you. And if you do that, I will commit to being there and we're going to get your sugars back down. I will serve as that surrogate, your neighbor. And so I thought to myself, well, not only could this patient and quite honestly, all of us use a nice little walk in the morning. Um, a lot of people could. And so I created a program and I called it walk with your doc. And I would show up and it started with her and I. And then I started kind of talking to my staff and the other other patients. And it became 10, it became 20, 50, 60, 70. We would have three generations of people walking together, dogs, it got rather unruly at times. But it was a beautiful thing. And I'll never forget looking back one day, I would sort of lumber behind them to make sure everybody was okay. We had other nurses and staff. And I remember thinking to myself, as I watched the people, strangers interact and laugh and talk. I remember thinking, people are forgetting about the difficulties in life, the challenges, the, the, the stuff that's really affecting them. And they're, they're disconnecting from that. And they're going on a walk. And it was just a beautiful thing to see people were forgetting about all of the stressors in life, the stock market, the, you know, politics and this and that. And it was just that simple. But that that simple walk, that simple interaction with that patient in the room 15 years ago really changed my life because it led me down this pathway of thinking more about education, thinking more of how do you approach people? How do you get to people and how do you get them to change and, and create those better habits? So it was something that is near and dear to me. It will always sit with me. But it was quite the story. Mm. I love that story because what just comes through for me is the heart that you have for your patients. You know, your your day's already super full. You're starting at 745 and yet here's someone who's lost her her walking partner and yeah. you offer, you know, to come to the office, right? An hour and 15 minutes earlier to help her get things back on track and then how your deep care for her then manifests itself into more people getting their exercise in in community yeah it really was it was sort of a movement no pun intended but it really was and it was about uh and and i work for a large uh hmo in, in san diego and i remember one morning a, a young lady came up to me and she said uh you know i i don't have my health insurance with your your medical group but my neighbor told me about this uh, do you think I could join? <laughs> I was like, of course you can join. So it was really about this very organic, um, uh, just cohesive thing that, that was that came together and brought people together. I, I mean, you know, it would be like a, a mom pushing a baby and, and that that mom, was, their parents were with them. You know, it was it was it was really a cool thing. And, uh, you know, it I'm happy to say like two or three months later, her sugars came back down and we were right back where we started. So it's not always about take more medicine or do this or do that. You know, medications I look at as a crutch. Certainly there are needs for them in terms of infections and, and what, of course these horrible cases of cancers and things like that. But I look at medications as crutches and, and you know, whether it's a crutch for your blood pressure or your sugars or whatever cholesterol, whatever it may be, until you can sort of get yourself up and running and do the best that you can from a lifestyle standpoint to see whether you even need that crutch moving forward. And uh, that's kind of really what it is. And, and uh, you know, you make that decision as you go on. But, I, you know, I tell my patients the best medication, I think, is no medication. And um, if you can get to where you need to be through just basic lifestyle changes, great. If not, we have that backup in, in going to the medications. Mm. I love how you share that with your patients. 
well, you know, you're someone, it seems like you've got it all figured out, the diet, the exercise, <laughs> the physician's practice, the New York Times bestselling books. And of course, this is a, a podcast. This is a show about well-known people like yourself having the opportunity to share their lesser well-known story of resilience. And so Dr. Mike, for you, as you think about your journey over the course of your life, tell us about a challenge for you that has significantly formed you into the person, into the man that you are today. You know, when I, so there's a, there's kind of a couple things that come to mind. First and foremost, when, when I was 12 years old, um, I had, so I come from a large family, four sisters, and um, there are three boys, so seven kids. And it was very close with my mother. I was the youngest of the seven. And my mom was just the coolest lady that ever existed. And just super fun, life of the party, just great. I mean, when she, you know, obviously a huge, you know, Catholic Mexican family and, and you know, everything was just a reason to get together and have fun. Um, and she was the one that, you know, we'd walk into a, a big family party and everyone couldn't wait to see her. So we were very close and I just admired her, her soul, her presence. And when I was 12 years old, my older brother was tragically killed in a motorcycle accident. And I still remember it like, yes, I was telling the story uh, to my girlfriend recently. Um, I still remember the day it happened. And I still remember, you know, being at home and my mom answering the, I answered the phone. I told the mom, my mom had said, it's some doctor, you know, you never think that this is, how could this happen? Right. I was 12. What did I know? And long story short, my mom and dad were gone for hours and hours and hours. And I was like, where are they? What are they doing? And when my dad came back, my mom was sitting in the back seat of the car, kind of lying there. And I was like, what is this all about? And unfortunately, my, my brother had passed. And it was this change in, in this, this spirit, this just in, in amazing woman that began to evolve. And she just never was quite the same. And obviously an amazing mother, amazing parent, amazing, you know, guide in my life. But I remember thinking, this is a, a big tragic thing. And, and I, I, I don't know, at 11 or 12, you're just, I don't know that you really grasp those things. So it, it was a really impactful thing. And my siblings, we've always said after that, mom was never the same. And she really never was. I mean, when you lose a child, there aren't a lot of things that that really, you know, affect you more. But fast forward to my life, six years ago, in a matter of a year, um, I went through a divorce, I went through the death of my mother, unfortunately, and then the death of my sister, and leaving my home. And, uh, you know, I, like my mom used to say, you know, I was getting too big for my britches. You know, I had a successful job. I had an amazing marriage and, a, you know, a great home and, and my health more important than anything. And it all ended. And what started with my wife uh, and I divorcing and then me leaving the home that we'd built next led to the death of my mom and my sister all within a year. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I'll tell you, had it not been for just my friends and my family and my therapist who I've been seeing for 20 plus years, I don't know what would have happened because the wheels were coming off in my life and uh, it, was, it was a challenge. Mm. I can only imagine what it must, must have felt like to experience so much loss. Yeah, it was. And, you know, my wife, obviously my wife didn't pass away like my family members did, but going through a divorce is much like, you know, a loss. And, and we are good friends and we've remained good friends. Um, and, uh, you know, when we were married, we also went through three miscarriages and uh, it was just so many things, you know, I, I, I it was hard to wrap my my head around and, and, you know, I put on all this weight and, you know, it was just so many things happened. Um, 
Uh, I, I don't know. It, the wheels came off is really the best way to, uh, to express it. But mm-hmm. we get through it. You, you do. You, you, I just don't lose faith in that human spirit. And, and, and I think you reach out to your support systems, as I call them, your bench. I'm a big sports fan. You go to your bench and you, and you find those people who are going to get you through that, that challenging time. And it may be for me, like I said, my, my therapist that I've been seeing for two decades, you know, sometimes life's good and we go in and we chat and I pay my fee and it's all good. But there are other days I walk in and I, and I say to her, you're going to earn your fee today because my life is, is uh, going south. So happens to all of us. It does. It does happen to all of us. You know, I'm struck by in your story, Dr. Mike, how when you lost your brother, you also lost the former version, the the vibrancy of your mother. You know, it was like a a compound loss for you, if you will. Right. And then sort of fast forward to this next moment in your life that occurred six years ago. And you had another series of, you know, compound losses. I love how you talk about even though divorce isn't a death, it's a significant loss. Were you able to take anything that you learned as a younger man at 12 and apply it, you know, to that time? Or did those two times, you know, did you have different coping strategies? How do you think about that? You know, what a question. And I, it's really, um, I've never had been asked that question before. I've never thought of that before. I thought, I thought I'd been asked every question in my, in my, in any of these interviews and things that I've done in the past, but it's a really good question. Um, I think you're, you know, I was a different person when I was 11 and 12, I was a kid. I, I was in sixth grade and, um, I, 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 I think my, my coping mech- mechanisms were still being built and evolving, right? That my foundational skills for dealing with life were in their infancy. And, and so um, I, I think for me, when I look back, now that you asked this question, I think I look back and I, I just realized that how quickly life can change on such a grandiose level. You know, I was literally sitting with my, you know, my hands under my chin, laying on my stomach, watching a baseball game with my little pet rabbit next to me. And the phone rang. I got up. I'll never forget because it was a baseball. It was a World Series game. And I got up. It was a Saturday. It was about four in the afternoon. And, you know, like I said before, this said, this is Dr. So-and-so, is your mom there? I'm like, yeah, she's my mom. And and I remember just going back to the baseball game, but after like three or four hours, and those days there was no cell phone, you, you know, it was like a, a whole to-do, right? It wasn't like you just pick up a phone or text or email. And then after like four hours, I remember going and sitting out on the stoop of my house and just kind of thinking, where are they? Why haven't they called them? What are they doing? So it was a dramatic moment, but I think if I look back, I think, man, life changed in in the snap. And, you know, fast forward to a few years ago, all of these things happened again. And I think, you know, there are these peaks and valleys in, in life that we go through. And we all hit these valleys and they're unfortunate. And it doesn't have to always be just you know, the loss of a life. It may just be the loss of a job. It may be the loss of uh, a friend. It may be a a move or just, you know, these valleys, I think can really be uh, so many different things and we all handle them differently. But I I don't know, I'm still just sort of stuck on that question because I, I think I just didn't have the skills yet when I was a kid. I don't know if you're supposed to, <laughs> I, I, you know, I think they were being built, but I, I can tell you this much is something that I, I remember so vividly, despite the fact that it was, you know, 40 years ago plus. Um, and maybe in some way it did kind of give me some 
some ideas for structure or I, I, I don't know, but, uh, you know, I say to my patients all the time, life is hard and, and it, it really is. It's not about how much money you have. It's not about where you live. It's not about how perfect things are. There will be a curveball thrown at you. And, uh, you know, there will be the elements that you have to deal with. It's just when are they going to come and in what form? And I think always doing your best to kind of be ready and have those sort of those strengths and those pillars in place is always the best thing. It's, it's preparation for the inevitable, I think. That's really powerful. Are there ways that you live your life today, Dr. Mike, that are that are informed by these experiences or informed by life? How has that shaped the person that you are and, and, and how you move through the world? You know, I, I've always told my patients, you know, there are four basic pillars to wellness. And when I say wellness, it's both physical and mental health. You need to be active mentally and physically. You need to fuel your body. And by that, I mean, eat healthy. You need to manage your, well, you need to hydrate and drink water. It's this, the easiest one, yet many of us struggle with that. And lastly, I, I, I say to people, you need to respect the stress in your life. Nothing makes me more frustrated when people say about stress. Oh yeah, you just got to deal with it. Or, oh yeah, it's part of life. I don't find that helpful. <laughs> I, I, mm -hmm. I feel like we need to respect the stress in our life and there is preventable and unpreventable. There are things that happen that you have no control over. And then there are things that happen that cause stress that you can sort of have some impact in. So I, I, I think it's stress management, hydration, being active mentally and physically and fueling your body. And every day I try to go through a mental checklist multiple times a day. And I'm like, what did I do to address these four pillars today? And I don't always get it right. And there are days where I'm like, I know I should go out for a walk or a bike or a swim or an exercise, but I don't have it in me. And tomorrow's another day. But I think if you do that mental checklist, and I also use a, a very specific tool with patients that I have been using for years, I call it the M&M, &M, which is mindfulness and motivation. And it simply means this, take five or 10 seconds to be mindful at the, of the task at hand. And what is your motivation for doing that? For example, I come home, it's been a long day. I know in my mind, I should go for 30 minutes of exercise. And why should I do that? Well, because I want to feel good. I want to be healthy. I want to get some extra, whatever it may be. Um, and I think everybody's mindful and motivated m and moments are different. And I think for some people, it's why should I choose the right foods? Because I want to be healthy, because I'm going to retire and I want to feel good. I want to travel because I want to set an example for my kids or my grandkids, whatever it may be. Why should you choose to do what we all know, like we had said earlier, right? We all know right from wrong. Why should we choose to do the best thing for ourselves mentally and physically? And if you take that five or 10 seconds to do that, um, I think eventually you start to answer those questions and you start to head down that pathway of wellness. But it's, it's something you got to do daily. It doesn't take a lot of time, but if you do it regularly, um, it starts to become just very, very simple. And it starts to become part of how you live your life. Um, and I try to use those tools every day. But I think respecting the stress in your life is really, really important. Hmm. I love that. I love that. And so, so we have a, we have another podcast guest, yeah. by the way, I don't know if you noticed. Oh yeah. Um, I, I, I'm, I have two of them walking around here. I'm waiting for them to like jump into the screen. I can, I can see them both right now. They're like, they're both just staring at me. They're like, we're going to wait for the opportunistic time for us to jump right on your lap. And, and they will, but I'm, I'm an animal lover. Beautiful. Me too. 
Me too. Well, I usually, she's usually out of the room, but I think she snuck in. I didn't know she was here. So this is Bluebell. This is my Maine Coon. Oh my and, gosh, so uh, beautiful. You can tell by the ears. Right, Hallmark. Beautiful. Yes, so so Bluebell may have some questions for you. I'm, but, all, uh, I'm all ears. I, I love, perhaps pun, in, pun intended, right? With the ears. <laughs> right. <laughs> So I love what you're saying about the the four pillars, about practicing these behaviors daily. And I think it's just always so powerful when we're, you know, when we're able to walk the walk and it's, it's not perfect, but it's, you know, we know what it feels like to sort of walk in the shoes of that prescription. And one of the things that you said that's so powerful is this idea of like, respecting the stress in our lives. Right. And so you mentioned a couple strategies for that. And I'm curious, what are some hallmarks that you see when people have a healthy respect for the stress in their lives? Yeah, I, I think it helps a great question. I, I think it helps them strategize how they maneuver through it. And by that, I mean, Oftentimes people focus, and this is an example I use with my patient. It really, when I use this, they're like, aha, uh -huh, I get it. I can sit at home and stress about the fact that there's a big rainstorm coming tomorrow. Now I have no control over the weather. I can't control the rain, but I need to get through my day knowing that there's a big storm coming tomorrow. I could stress about the weather. I could get upset about the weather, climate change, you know, why does it have to rain tomorrow? I have to go to this important meeting, but I don't have control over that. But I can control the factors around that element. I can wear a raincoat. I can take an umbrella. I can mm -hmm. go early to my meeting. I can maybe go away where I may not have so much traffic. I can drive careful. So the point being that there are a lot of things that we don't have control over but that, that simple aspect of our lives, we may be able to exert some elements of control over an unchangeable entity. And that's the example mm -hmm. that I use. So I think it's strategizing. I think it's, you know, I can't control what the stock market does, but I can control talking to my investment team or how I can, you know, do this or do that, strategizing to sort of help maneuver through the, these elements. And so a lot of things, and I tell people, think about what's stressing you out and think about how, what do you have control over in this, in this, you know, this entity, and then think about what you do have control over and exercise those, those things. And I think it's just about developing strategies and it will happen again. It will come again. That problem will present itself and you can learn from it. Last time it rained, I didn't go to work early and I was late and there was traffic. So I'm going to go earlier this time. Or I forgot my umbrella, so I'm going to make sure I have my umbrella. All of these things. And it sounds rather trivial, but when you apply basic principles to the complicated life that with many of us, most of us, probably all of us live, you really strategize and you really become really good at living life because it's hard, as I said before. One of the other things I tell my patients all the time is tell me what you can do, not what you can't do. And, and tell me what you've done, not what you failed to do. And that whole idea is let's think about what you're capable of doing and let's start there. And let's look at what you've accomplished and, and applaud ourselves rather than look at what we failed to do. And I think if we go through life like that, you get num number one, you start to give yourself credit for living this challenging life. And you also start to get momentum. And I may not be able to run a marathon tomorrow, but I can walk a mile and that mile becomes two. And so start with what you're able to do and, and work towards where you want to go. Mm, I love that. That's such such great advice. And I love your emphasis on really the positive elements of what people can do, what they've done, rather than beating ourselves up for all the times that we feel like we fell short. 
Yep. And we all do it. We all do. We, we, we're just, uh, you know, caught up in, in this, the challenges and the distractions and, and our responsibilities as, as a parent and our job, a significant other, whatever it may be. Um, but you know, it, like that, that, Move, one of my favorite movies, The Shawshank Redemption, one of my top five. Oh my five. gosh, isn't that one the best? It's one of my magical. favorite too. Well, magical movie. But there's a point in that movie um, where when the gentleman gets out of the institution and he says, life went and got itself in a big hurry. And it's true, it has. You know, this merry-go-round is just spinning and you're just hanging on you know, trying not to get thrown off. And uh, it will eventually slow down, it will eventually stop, but it, you got to have some tactics in place to, to, you know, brace yourself for, for the merry go round, and, and we'll all get through it. And that's where you, you know, I think your support system is, is without a doubt, the most important thing when it comes to lifestyle change, no matter what you're trying to do, quit smoking, become more active, lose weight, Whatever it is, the support system, that structure is how you push through. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, I love that you talked about having an opportunity for challenges to show up more than once. And if we don't sort of address them or effectively address them the first time they come around, they have this way of coming around again. And one of the questions I'd prepared for you actually is, has there been a lesson for you that's been difficult to learn that's kept coming back until it's taught you what you needed to know? You know, um, I, th I think for me, it's that um, you tend to really not appreciate a lot of the things in life that I guess we take for granted a lot of things in life. You know, um, you take for granted that, that I, I have a, a great job and a, a great career. And, you know, I, I worked hard at it. You know, my, my mom was a preschool teacher. My father was a janitor in a grocery store. So we went to school and I took student loans through college and undergrad and med school and, I, you know, got out of there with 300 plus thousand dollar in debt. But you just kind of roll through and you figure things out. But I think sometimes to me, it's that, and I think this happens as you get older, you, you start to realize that all the stuff that you see and do and interact with every day is not going to be here forever. And for me, experiencing loss, like when you're a kid to think to yourself, I'm never going to see this person again. It's a weird thing. It's a, it's weird when you're younger, because I don't think you really process that. Um, but as you get older and, and you experience, you know, loss of life, you're like, you won't see these people again. And it, I think for for me, it's really kind of respecting every moment of your life, every phone call. Yeah, I get in fights with my brothers and sisters and, you know, I don't call, they don't call, I don't text, you know, you know it happens to all of us. But, you know, I think being the bigger person and just being like, hey, um, and it's a bit of a cliche because people will say, oh, you know, always take the opportunity, but really always do take the opportunity, always be that bigger person because life is precious. Life does not last forever. And, uh, I, I think taking the high road is really the thing you got to do because, um, you know, holding a grudge or, or whatever it may be, it's not going to do anyone any good. And at least putting your best foot forward and, and always trying to kind of he mend any of those wounds in your life, whatever they may be, always trying, right? Never give up. And uh, at least you, you, you put your head down on the pillow at night and you're like, okay, I did, I did my best today. And that's it. That's all anybody can ask of you. Do your best as a parent, as a, as a, uh, you know, a significant other, as a doctor, as a, whatever you do in life do the best you can do and always put your best foot forward. And I think if you do, you you can't fault yourself. Mm. That's sage. That's sage advice. 
<laughs> Sage advice. I like that. Yes. Yes. Well, what's what's an element, Dr. Mike, from the 17 day <laughs> kickstart diet? What's an element that you are so excited for people to uncover in this book? Maybe it's a chapter or a, a new idea. I'm sure there's so many. You know, this project um, was about three and a half years in the making. And um, I, when I, when I wrote it, the introduction is really a story about some of the difficulties I experienced and some of the stuff I expressed earlier when we were discussing this. And it wasn't written and it wasn't done in, in a sense to say, feel sorry for me because look what I went through. It's actually meant for everybody to read it and put down and say, what happened to me? And so, it's just my story. We all have our own stories and some which have been bottled up and, and kept from really kind of investigating and, and self-investigating. It may have been a product of your childhood, um, neglect or whatever it may have been. You know, I, I work a lot with, with obesity and a lot of people struggle with lifestyle change. And like we were saying, right, we all know right from wrong, but what is it that makes us choose wrong? And I think really examining, again, it could be going to some adverse childhood event. It could be something in your life that created you and, and made you who you are. The elements of being healthy, exercising, eating right, manage your stress, develop support systems, right? All those things. But the true importance of this book and what I invite people to do is read the introduction and don't think about me and don't think about what happened to me and don't think about feeling sorry for me. Read that introduction and reflect on yourselves, reflect on your life, reflect on perhaps difficulties. Maybe it requires professional therapy. I, I've been in it for two decades, same person that I see. And I just want people to allow themselves to do some self-investigation because I think that that foundation is what needs to be uncovered in order to pursue lifestyle change. The chapters will be there. I will teach you how to eat properly. I'll teach you some great recipes, how to start exercising, how to manage your stress, how to manage chronic pain, whatever it may be, right? All of those things. But before you can get to those things, you need to examine yourself and figure out why do I choose wrong when I know right? And uh, it, for some, it's many, it's much more complicated. And, and you know, those true uh, impact of, of, again, stemming from childhood, divorce, uh, you know, so many things. So I think the answer to the question and my long lengthy answer is read the introduction, or even if you don't read the book, I, you know, I hope everybody listening to this podcast takes the time to reflect on themselves and say, yeah, maybe I never really looked at some of the stuff I went through as a child. And maybe I need to kind of go through that stuff a little more because it may lead to proper decisions about your health moving forward. And then you spread that news and you, you set those examples for other people, friends, kids, you know, family, whatever it may be. But I think it's a self-investigative uh, thing that, that I invite people to do because a lot of us don't, we don't do it. We just, again, just barrel through life. Yeah. Living, living the examined life. And in this case, really getting to see what the impact of our experiences is or are on our, on our health and our diet and our exercise. It, it's, it's so true. And, and, you know, we reiterate and we keep revisiting, you know, but we all know um, right from wrong. And it's how do we choose right from wrong? And, and I think that goes back to, uh, you know, perhaps for many of us, some deep seated things that we really need to kind of uncover and, and um, you know, create that structure, right? That true foundation. I, you and I have spoken in, in, you know, briefly before several weeks back. And I mentioned that, you know, I look at the building of a skyscraper, right? And I think to myself, as you build this hundred story skyscraper, 
the taller it gets, the more elements it has to overcome. Wind and sleet and snow and earthquakes and whatever it may be. But the, the, those buildings, it's the foundation of those buildings, right? It's, it's that true, the base of that building and the foundation. And as you go higher and higher, and as we live life longer and longer, the elements will take their, their shots at us. But if you build a solid foundation, that skyscraper can go floor after floor after floor after floor and withstand those elements and get through those challenging times and maintain this beautiful structure um, called life. But it starts with the foundation. It really does. Hmm. That's an incredible metaphor. I love that skyscraper metaphor. It makes so much sense. And Dr. Mike, tell us about where we can find you online and interact more with your work and the work that you're doing every day. So I, as I mentioned earlier, I still see patients every day. I practice in San Diego and have for 25 years now. Um, but a lot of my work connectivity that I do with millions of people, you know, the, the original book was translated in 16 languages. So I do a lot of online presence. Um, the website is drmikediet.com. Um, I do a lot of sort of uh, support um, programs to from people all over the world to talk about how to get healthy, to talk about whether it's losing weight or become active or learn stress management skills. I, I work with an amazing support team. Uh, we do a lot of what we call 17 day challenges, where we embark on this journey together to support each other. And you'll meet people virtually from all over the world. Um, and we learn of each other's struggles, but we learn how to support each other to improve lifestyle. And whatever that may be, it's not always about losing pounds. It's about, you know, so many other things. So drmikediet.com will have pretty much everything you need. You can learn more about the 17 day challenges that we do and, uh, you know, meet some great friends and learn some great tools of uh, um, mindfulness and of resilience, right? The word of the uh, of the decade, probably, quite honestly, it may be the word of my entire lifetime will be resilient. I mean, wow, I don't think I, I have ever used or, or, you know, heard that word used more in the last two years than I have in my entire life. And Let's hope that uh, it doesn't repeat itself, that the struggles that we've all had these last couple of years, and hopefully we learn and, and we become stronger. But uh, resilience is the word of the decade, <laughs> without a doubt. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And I think there's a lot of people who are exhausted by hearing the word resilience as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what I try to impart to people is like, look, resilience isn't exhausting. You know, resilience is the skill set. Resilience right. is the toolkit. It's it's the vehicle that that helps us move through the challenge. It's the significant challenge, change, and complexity we've been experiencing that's that's exhausting. And you know, we're hopeful we won't have to use this toolkit as much in the future. Right. And when that time arises you know, we'll know we've got the tools and the skill sets to show up for that occasion, especially with all the wonderful wisdom and, and guidance and, and personal stories that you shared with us today. Well, and I know you do the same thing with, with these podcasts and with the work that you do. And, uh, you know, I, I like to think uh, you and I collaborate along with so many other people who do the type of work that we do. And, uh, you know, we collectively, we can, as, as human beings, we can, uh, we can kind of like uh, string things along to help people get through difficult times. So I, I appreciate the work you do as well. And I'm sure many, many, many people do in your life and the people you come across. So uh, we're all fortunate. Absolutely. We're all out there as an army for good and light. And it, it takes a village. It takes a community. And I'm so grateful to get to learn more about the work that you're doing. You're truly an inspiration personally. And I know that you've brought inspiration, motivation, health to millions of people, the lives that you've touched. And so what an honor to talk with you today, Dr. Mike, and, and what a, a tremendous, a tremendous gift to have you on the show. 
Thank you so much. I just enjoyed talking with you. And, and you know, I, I hope that your listeners are able to take some nuggets from our conversation and some pearls from you and from me and uh, share them. But I really appreciate those kind words. And I appreciate you taking the time to speak with me today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Michael. It's great to have you. Until the next time, have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thanks so much. You do the same.